Hi everybody, welcome back. Today's topic is about gases. But it's more than the gases in the previous topic, solid liquid gas. Because here, we are going to talk about ideal gas. Right, we're almost done. So, do make sure you keep your energy high. Now, in this topic, gases, we want to talk about four key points here. The kinetic molecular theory, the ideal gas law, Dalton's law of partial pressures, and Henry's law. It's important to understand the gases around us because we breathe in every day. Right now, nitrogen, oxygen, and out you go, CO2. First of all, the kinetic molecular theory. Understand the relationship between kinetic energy and temperature. Temperature is a commodity that humans coin. And we measure by different scale, degrees Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin. But what is it really? It is a measurement of amount of kinetic energy. And we talk about it. Kinetic energy based on physics is equal to half mv square, right? And almost everything that's a motion, we have kinetic energy that like it would suggest. Because we do not have negligible mass and we have velocity, and therefore it gives rise to kinetic energy. But what this theory means is, and the key point to take away, when you have a fixed temperature, all gases have the same average Ke. Okay, keywords are same temperature. It depends on which gases you are, your mass or identity. You must have the same average Ke. Why we need to use the term average? Because sometimes it's about variations. Just like we're heating a pot here of water, the base is a bit hotter than the top here, but if you stir it rigorously, most of the part we have roughly the same energy. Okay, and because molecules, right, gaseous state, they're always moving, they must have kinetic energy. So here we have a formula that shows Ke equals half of every square, and you can translate to 3 kT over 2 here, where K is your Boltzmann distribution constant. And then your T is your temperature in Kelvin. Now we want to find the average molar kinetic energy. Molar, remember molar mass per mole of something, mole per mole of molecules. You can change it to the 3 RT over 2 here. Okay? We need to attribute to the scientists who give rise to the maximum Boltzmann distribution. So we have Ludwig Boltzmann, an Austrian mathematician and physicist, and James Clerk Maxwell, a Scottish mathematician here. And based on the good work, they gave us this distribution here that shows the variations of the gases at the same temperature. You notice that when the gas have a lower mass here, the peak of the graph shift right and down, right? Okay, and the area tend to remain the same. What they're saying is that when your gas is lighter, at the same temperature, you have the same total kinetic energy. But since the mass is lower, the volume, the velocity must compensate, so the V must be higher, and therefore like H2 has a higher velocity on average than an O2 molecule at the same temperature. And this is the mathematical proof here. All right. Translation, mean average velocity. When you see this bracket here, okay? This means it's average, okay? Mean, mean average. Mean root square is how we coin this term here. Okay. Now, we look at the average thermal energy. Molecules that's always moving, they have a velocity, and this gives rise to Ke, right? If you talk about it. But I would like to show you one example. But first, give you a question to attempt. Given this the Boltzmann constant, and this the um, Avogadro's constant, estimate the average thermal velocity at room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, for the particles, which has equal mass to this. 100 kg, 1 nanogram, 1 picogram, and the mass of an O2 molecule. Give it a try. 
these are the answers. I hope you calculate it by hand and calculator and not by generative AI or any large language model. If I want to focus on the first part here, I want you to understand the proportion for 100 kilogram mass of a gas at 20 degrees Celsius is moving at 1.1 times 10 power negative 11 meters per second. Essentially, it is about 1 cm in 30 years. It is slow, very slow, but how slow? To put into perspective, it's like the slow motion when you're up in the outer sphere. Look at the astronaut. Things are moving so slowly, that kind of speed. Okay. And then now we look at oxygen molecule that we are again breathing in and out for respiration, 480 meters per second. So when you do calculations, right, remember temperature must be always be in SI unit system in the now. So compensate by topping up 273.15, right? Then you get a Kelvin from degree Celsius. Now we know that the mass of an oxygen molecule is 0 0.032 kilogram. How do we get that? We assume first one mole of O2 gas. One mole of O2 in the mole concept, you have 32 grams, right? Using MR. So 32 grams is 0 0.032 kilogram. But in one mole, you have got Avogadro's number of molecules. So per molecule, you would have this mass, okay? Very light. Next, we come to the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law came from a few laws combined together. The guy Luzak, the Boyce law, the Charles law, the Dalton's law, and the Avogadro's law. But here we focus on a couple of laws here, Henry's law and Dalton's law. First, we need to know the equation called the PV equals an RT. Right. Now, ideal meaning that the molecules do not occupy any volume and do not interact with each other. This is a dream because any molecules, even no matter how small they are, they have atoms, they have electrons, right? They occupy some volume, it is not zero, which means that you must occupy volume. But what it's trying to say is to get to neutral ideal gas behavior, it doesn't occupy too much of a volume, it's too not too big, that's so sizable. And because we also learned in the previous topic about Molecular interactions, anything that has electrons and protons, we have Van der Waals forces, dispersion forces, London London forces. So there will be some attractions, but how strong is it depends on whether you have hydrogen bonding, ion dipole, those things like that. To be ideal, they're saying that how do you have an ideal gas behavior? You make sure that this interaction is extremely low, almost zero. You don't occupy any volume. So if you take a look at the gases that you know in the periodic table, the gas that's most ideal could probably be like helium because helium is so spherical, right? It's so tiny, one of the smallest atom around and you don't really interact much, so inert. In this equation, to plug the values in, make sure you have the right unit. Volume, meter cube, temperature, Kelvin, and small n's number of moles, and pressure is in Pascal. R is the ideal gas constant, 8.31. Four five joule per mole per Kelvin. Okay, so the unit somehow tells you clues about this number. What it means there is a measure of energy. Next, I turn to Charles' law. Very important here, but I like to give reference to Jacques Charles, 1746 to 1823. He was a balloonist. He was curious about air and balloon here. And if you have seen hot air balloon here, oh, we have written written on one. Have you? In Turkey and other countries there, right? We rise up, we see beautiful mountains and view and take many photos there. At the start, there's no flame. It start the flame and then the hot air balloon rises, right? Okay, it get bigger. So this is what the law talk about here. At a control number of moles of gases and the pressure, when we raise the temperature, we increase volume. Basically saying thermal expansion. Increasing T, Increasing V expansion, okay? So, now, how do we apply Charles' law here? We know that we can't go to absolute zero, no matter how advanced our innovations are. Absolute zero is when T equals to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, zero Kelvin 
we can get very close but never there. But we can do a lot of experiments and do we we do extrapolations, we put it back, back, and then we get zero here because of the origin. So you can't validate the law there. Okay, absolutely zero. Next we have Dalton's law. Dalton's law talk about the partial pressure. It is just essentially saying that when you have a system, right, you have gas A, gas B, gas C, each of them contribute the pressure to form the total pressure. And the number of moles of each gas contribute the total number of moles. So it's like proportional to the number of moles of the gases, okay, the pressure. And to prove to you, when we, in this case, let's assume we have three kinds of gases, N1, N2, N3, N in total, we have this N. We break it down, right, we take out R, T over V, this is called factorization, and then we multiply it. Expand it out, we notice that this is, isn't that just the pressure of the gas one, pressure of gas two, pressure of gas three? So it validates Dalton's law that the total pressure is the sum of the individual partial pressure of the gases. X1, these are just a mathematical representation here. This is the mole fraction, right? The number of moles of one over total number of moles of gases. Okay. So X2 means the number of moles of two over the total number of gases. Okay, you apply here. Next, Henry's law. Henry's law is very interesting because it talk about the effective um, gas, gaseous solubility okay, in a liquid here. In this case, we refer to water. So bubbling water, right? I love sparkling water. Right? Now, it defines the amount of solute gas dissolved in the solution is directly proportional to its partial pressure above the solution there. Right? We open a can of drink here, bubbles come up right, and the surface escape here. And in Henry's law, it's just a simple formula called C equals is Kp. C stands for molarity of gas solubilized. That's a concentration in the liquid. K is the Henry's law constant. It's unique for different uh, gases at a different temperature at a different liquid. P is the partial pressure of the gas here. So if you pump a lot of gas, of course, you can dissolve more of the gas, right? Right? Yeah. So the Henry's law constant at 25 degrees Celsius in water for these gases as such here, nitrogen, oxygen, CO2. And we are making comparison. The first thing is to look at the indices, okay, or the standard form. 10, negative 4, 10, negative 3, 10, negative 2. CO2's Henry's law constant here is the highest, lowest is nitrogen. What it really means is that when you're trying to mix sparkling water here, if you have a choice of the gas, I will pick CO2 because you can compress more gases there, right, in the liquid than your nitrogen here, okay? Next time you drink a glass of champagne, think of Henry's Law. Think of my chapter on gases. This is so applicable in daily life because I love to drink sparkling water. I make bubble water home here. I think of the vessel, what gas is inside. You know, we can't taste between the CO2, O2, or N2 gas. We have no... No senses for that, right? We can only all know that the bubbles being compressed, right? It feels good there. But you want to make sure it's, you know, the highly, highly bubble. You don't want to lose so many bubbles on a hot day, right? We have a beer or something. Now, now you know this, and you'd be curious to know that in Ireland, you know, Guineas, they purposely put N2, they spend more resources to compress more nitrogen gas in the guinea so that it retains the foam so much, it foams a lot. That's part of the characteristics of the beverage. Okay, But most of the carbonated drinks, like the word suggests, carbonated, just CO2 because it's a lower task, uh, soluble, and O2 is a bit expensive because we prefer to use this uh, gas for other purposes like scuba diving. So this is the implication when you compare to Henry's Law, right? And when I drink Coke, when I drink Sprite, 7 Up, Pepsi, Cola, you whatnot, I think of this too. Now, for those of you who do scuba diving, we talk about it, and this is a very popular spot in uh, Asian countries, in Singapore, Malaysia, tropical, you know. I've done it before in the Red Sea. And um, you might want to think about decompression sickness, and the coach will have taught you that. Now, in the air, like uh, open my line suggesting that this air is proportionate about one-fifth uh, oxygen, four-fifth of uh, nitrogen, to be exact, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen here. When you go down to the ocean and come up too quickly, you have this sickness, fatigue and pain. 
and sometimes it takes you in a few hours to feel this pain here. And the reason is because they have different mass, MR. We talk about the law just now, okay? Different solubility at different pressure and temperature. When you go down the ocean, going to the seabed, the pressure gets higher, right? As the depth goes up. So what happens is, right, the solubility of nitrogen is different. But when you try to come up here, right, if you are not very careful and it's not gradual, you want to see the skylight so quickly, you start to see N2 bubbles being formed. And N2 bubbles form because in the Henry's Law concept just now, you know that N2 is the least soluble among the three gases shown. But you know that blood vessels normally do not contain any gas bubbles. It's liquid, right? Blood. Blood has dissolved CO2, has dissolved O2. You learn it in the buffer experiment. So what it means is you have now bubbles, air pockets there in your blood vessels that essentially are most of the time fluid. You got a problem there, okay? Now, that's pretty much this topic. It sounds like a lot, but I broke it down to smaller pieces there. Next time, you know, when you um, drink a canned drink, or you drink water, see, like I just have some hot water, I boil and add some water, you see, I drink it. Mm. When I boil water, oxygen escape, remember, because when you heat up, right, the interaction between the O2 and H2 molecules become weakened, so it escape. So unlikely here you have too much O2, maybe zero, right? But now when exposed to air, the CO2 dissolves back inside here. So in this topic, you learn about the kinetic molecular theory, okay? Formulas to know the root mean square of molecules of ideal gas, okay? Ideal gas law, PV and RT, know the unit, Delta's law of partial pressure, and Henry's law, okay? So with that, I've essentially come out finish this topic here. You should be able to explain to your friends and next time when you drink your San Pellegrino, okay, I drink it and I always observe that. In Singapore, it's different from my drink in Ireland, in Italy. Right? It's not because it's made from different countries, because the environment is different, the humidity, the temperature. So the amount of CO2 can start you know, and can, be, can escape to the air. The speed is different, right? So I always think about science and here, I'm not promoting this, but Hear this. Ah, oh, look at that. Hear the sizzling sound? Do you hear it? I can see it. Okay. Ooh, bubbles here. Reward yourself with a uh, gaseous strength after this, you did well. I'll see you next time.